Welcome, Chloe. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you here, and we know that our listeners will be super excited to hear about Chloe, who you are and your journey, and um, just lessons learned so that we can help our listeners accelerate their success. So without further ado, um, welcome. And who is Chloe? Tell us, tell us your journey. Oh, I really appreciate you inviting me here today. This is really fun to get to do, especially because I believe so much in what you're building and the purpose of Beyond Barriers. So this is a real thrill for me. So it's interesting. Um, I, I have always struggled with the notion of having, I don't know, a journey or a story that is worth telling. I, I'm sort of in the business and I have been in the past 20 years of my career in life trying to figure out a way to make sure that women and people of color that I've spent my life trying to serve have a chance to tell their story, but I get a little, I don't know, shy. I wasn't raised by parents who <laughs> trained me to believe that you sort of tell your own story, but I, I do think it's valuable. And certainly some of the most important things I've learned have been from listening to leaders talk about their stories. Mm -hmm. so I thought in advance about this. And I think one of the turning points in my life, I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We spent some years living abroad in the South of France. And so I had a life that was sort of both exposed and broad, and mm -hmm. yet at the same time incredibly narrow and incredibly sheltered by virtue of the siloed nature of Cambridge and the relative sort of bubbled comfort of living in France. And I had this moment after I graduated or as I was graduating of really needing to break away from that. And mm -hmm. I took a sharp turn. Most of my college classmates went into consulting and banking and I took a completely divergent path, uh -huh. went into politics. And oh, then wow. I fought in Ecuador. I, I just felt this visceral need to break from things that had felt prescribed and sort of in order. Mm -hmm. So I found myself working, I'm from Boston, but working in Oakland, California for a very progressive member of Congress, Barbara mm. Lee, who was my hero. And I was her campaign director for six years. And I was young. I had no business having that <laughs> job. I did not know what I was doing at all, at all, at all. But I learned, you know, I, I say that it was sort of this ultimate entrepreneurial job, which just means I did all the jobs and I made a lot of mistakes and I built as I went. But very importantly, it was both a, a, I would say, a period of functional and technical skill building, but it also was consciousness raising and awareness raising for me in profound and irreversible ways. I could tell many, many stories, but there's one that mm -hmm. I will never forget that actually becomes more poignant with every passing year. I was probably 25 and I decided, uh, it was maybe three years into my time working in Oakland, that I wanted to help bring exposure to high school students around civic education and political organizing, kind of, mm -hmm. it would be voters and get them engaged in the process. And so I organized a high school voter education initiative. I forget what it was exactly called. So I had about maybe eight kids from Berkeley and Oakland and, and uh -huh. Alameda. Most of them were African-American and Latino, um, Asian-American as well. And we started the first kickoff meeting with, so what does everyone want to do in their life and what do you want to be when you grow up right. now brief context here it had been an incredibly painful summer in oakland the murder rate was at record highs mm. kids were getting uh shot at on their ways home from school it was an intense the numbers were really it was maybe august the numbers were going up and i will never forget a 16 year old girl said what do i want to be when i grow up i just want to be alive Oh, wow. And for a second, I thought, I don't even know that I heard her correctly, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I still 20 years later feel like a, like a bucket of cold water splashed in my face. Right. It was embarrassing. It was humbling. I realized the vast amounts that I don't know. I think it's harder to think about that story now because I have my own kids, mm -hmm. but it was, it was almost going back to basics of, I don't know so much. And I'd already moved on the path of wanting to help mm -hmm. and serve and be in communities of color, but that became a lifelong pursuit of, I want to help. I want to be in communities that I don't belong in, mm -hmm. where I am the, sort of in the minority. Um, and I keep on thinking about how unfair that was for her that she mm -hmm. didn't have the possibilities in front of her that I had. And I just don't want that to be true for anybody else. It still is, but I, I've really been committed because of that girl. 
Mm, fantastic. That's an amazing story. And what I take from it, though, is like you said, you, you mentioned a, a bit where you decided to take a different path. You were kind of following um, this passion where you were wanting to help and take something different. But how did you, you know, especially taking on roles that you said I knew nothing about, um, how did you define or get clarity around, you know, the strengths and the skill sets and, you know, your purpose and what you wanted to do, but at the same time, you know, throw your, you know, throw your name in the hat and take on a role that you know nothing about. Like, how did you get past that fear of not knowing? I think in my 20s and early 30s, I had probably an overabundance of confidence. Mm. I just didn't (laughs) know what I didn't know. And I really had this belief that I could do anything. Mm. And what kept on happening is I would take these jobs that were uh, beyond me probably. And I think probably there was something that people saw that suggested being enterprising and being creative and being resilient. Mm -hmm. But for sure, at least for the first year or two, and my second big job was as the executive director of a little nonprofit in New York called the Council of Urban Professionals. Yes. I was the first ED and we grew it in New York and then LA. I didn't know how to do that job at all. Um, but I think there was a uh, ye- period of a year or two where I kind of expected it was going to be gruesome and painful and uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And I, I got comfortable with that period of rapid learning curve and discomfort. I think in both cases too, though, the campaign and then cup, I had a mentor who was uh, intentional about coaching me. Mm. And so I am now, and I ran, I ran track. And so the notion of coaching, and that's why I love what you do so much is so profoundly important to me. And I had a coach kind of behind me mm-hmm. in both of those cases, um, letting me take a lot of risks. I made a ton of mistakes. And I'll never forget in both the campaign, in the campaign, my, my mentor, Lee Halterman said to me, I made a big mistake. I was sobbing. Uh, he said, I cannot have you be afraid. You have to be able to make mistakes, mm. but you can't then live in fear about making the other one. So you, you got to move past this. You're going to make another mistake tomorrow and that's going to be okay. Mm, I love that. And you know, that is actually a really great point because a lot of the women we work with talk about the fear of failure and not really embracing the idea of failure and, um, you know, struggling with perfectionism. I mean, I'm, I suffer from that as well. Um, what do you do to help you get past that? Like to, you know, know that you ha- still have that little bit of fear, fear of failure, but then you just push forward, whether you know you're going to make the mistake or not. What do you do? Yeah. How do you get into that mental state? I still do. I'm actually having chills because I'll tell you about an experience that I had this summer. One of the people that I love the most on this topic is my dear friend, Reshma Saujani, who runs Girls Who Code, but also mm-hmm. sends out, I think it's a Friday failure. She sends out a newsletter. And oh, what I love, I love about it, so she tells a story of a way that she screwed up and it's really real and it's really embarrassing and it's totally human. So that's my sort of Friday treat. I love reading those. So I just had an experience of not just failure, but sort of very public failure. I had a Mm -hmm. job, uh, my last uh, inside a company job. Mm -hmm. And I took a job in a department that was in the midst of big turmoil. Mm -hmm. Um, And things went really well for a while. And then things took a total turn and it was public and it was across the whole Mm -hmm. company. And I was the public face of it. And so I was apologizing and taking the blame for it. And Mm -hmm. I felt that was my responsibility as a leader to do, Mm -hmm. but it was brutal. And I don't love who loves criticism, but I I take it very personally. And it was an environment where there was a lot of, uh, individual critic, you know, there was just a lot of, it felt like I was in the middle of a hurricane. And even after I left that job, I felt so guilty and so bad. I felt like I'd let the CEO down, who was my good, good friend, mm-hmm. even though he said, of course not, it's, you know, it's not your fault. But I was driving and I, I love Brene Brown, but I hadn't quite become a devotee of Brene Brown yet. It was over the summer and I listened to one of her podcasts about critics mm-hmm. and failure. And I had to stop the car, I had to pull a car over because she read the poem, uh, The Man in the Arena. Now I've probably heard that 50 times, but I had never heard it before. And the notion is it is only those who dare greatly who get in the arena and Mm -hmm. get in the muck 
that uh, both feel the pain of failure, but also the sort of wonder and glory of having pushed some things across the finish line. And it's safer to be a critic. It's safer to sort of sit up in the arena. And, mm -hmm. and I just felt yeah. this relief wash over me about, I remembered what I'd been trying to do. I was trying to help. I was trying to have integrity. I was trying to be brave. I didn't know, I actually really didn't know what I was doing, but that it, it's to be in good company to try and to fail. And you mm -hmm. just got to pick yourself up again. So that was that I wish I'd known, I wish I'd absorbed that poem 10 mm. years ago. I didn't, but mm -hmm. I now have it and I'm going to carry it with me. That is, that is really profound. And I know the feeling where you're like, you've heard something a thousand times, but it doesn't really sink in until, you yeah. know, that, that moment, it's a ha aha moment. And you just yes. have to pause for a minute and just take it all in. Um, but I love that. And I do love the, the, you know, the, that notion of it's so much easier to be a critic and it's, you know, again, but though it's easier said than done, right. Of like, just let that, you know, wash off, roll off your back and, and whatnot. Um, but it's really hard to, you know, one, look at the feedback, look at it as feedback, right? We always say feedback's a gift, but sometimes they're gifts that you don't necessarily enjoy. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think there's something too, I've been trying to think about this a lot. I used to run uh, track in, mm -hmm. in high school and college. I ran indoor and cross country. And one of the things that I've recalled recently is when you run, you are evaluating yourself against your own yardstick mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Certainly you want to win, but actually sometimes you just want to make a certain time because you're trying to qualify for the state meet. And it has given me this new way of thinking about mistakes. You know, when you do your own self-evaluation after something that didn't go well, mm -hmm. did I show up with integrity? Was I kind to the people around me? Did I make honest mistakes? Yes, but were they honest? Were they done in sort of having mm -hmm. tried? So I, I, this is such a cliche, but some of the best and most profound lessons of my life have been when I've completely effed up and fallen on the floor and you, you feel them more deeply, mm -hmm. but then being compassionate with yourself in the post analysis Mm -hmm. I'm trying to learn that better. <laughs> yes. But I do think that's where a lot of these lessons get absorbed. And I think that's very important is the post analysis because I think that's where everybody misses it, right? They try something, they make the mistake and they're like, okay, and they'll move on. But it's like, okay, what, what could I do different next time? And I think it is truly is that post analysis that then prepares you for the next time you start recognizing the mile markers, right? Of like, okay, last time at this, at this place, you know, I... I didn't run my own race. I tried to yeah. keep up with someone that like, it's those little things that you realize, like run your own race, do your best and, and kind of like navigate the way that you need to. So I think it's fantastic. The post um, reflection um, is the most important thing I think that we all miss. And sometimes I do too, because you're like, ah, eh, that was painful. I don't want to, I don't want to look, think about that right now. Yeah. <laughs> and moving forward. Now uh, share with me a little bit about but you've done, you've done a little bit, a lot of different roles where you transition into different roles. Um, how do you make sure, how do you execute? Like once you get there, how do you make sure that you do a phen phenomenal job? What is, what are some habits that you do to make sure that you begin executing even in a space you not, may not be familiar with? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think I've always done this right. And I think one of the reasons I haven't is I've worked until fairly recently always in startups, in environments that were completely chaotic and where I was, again, probably too young and probably inappropriately, but I was in charge. And so there was no, until very recently, an onboarding process and a period of a listening mm -hmm. tour, like that notion of gather your data, build your strategy, start testing things has been until recently completely foreign. And so I think what I did in my first young roles was to figure out fairly quickly though what were the absolutely necessary resources that I needed mm -hmm. to even start moving a few balls forward so I remember when I worked for Barbara Lee it was just me mm -hmm. and, and so the first day I called through a list of about 100 volunteers I needed bodies I needed I couldn't get any I needed some momentum I needed some troops and resources so that I know that sounds rather small but I needed to mm -hmm. quickly analyze I've got to execute an event in four weeks. Okay, that's not going to happen by myself. So I, I need to figure out what was the bare minimum. I think what I've learned more recently, though, is to require the time to figure out 
what is the what is the lay of the land? Right. <laughs> what am I looking at? And let me build in the time to do some analysis of data, who matters, what are we trying to do here? Mm-hmm. And then also then reserve the right. And in fact, say the strategy is going to include some testing of things, some mm-hmm. fast failures, and some refining and then testing again. Uh, I think that that's really important to do good work. And I, I, bizarrely, I'm 42. It's been fairly recently. I tend to, my husband always says, I just lean in, dive in and move too fast. True. It served me well. <laughs> but I think as I advanced in my career, uh, at last, he always says, you know, measure twice, cut once. I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a thoughtful way to think about it. You do cut, you're decisive but figure out a little bit of what you're doing first. Mm. Yeah. And I, that's really important in terms of being decisive. So that is something else that, you know, a lot of uh, the women that we work with have, you know, they struggle with Mm decision-making. So share, you know, me, maybe some tips or a framework that you use when you are making difficult, difficult decisions, right. Or taking risks. Like how do you, how do you make those decisions? So it's interesting. I'm forgetting which probably it was Harvard Business Review, but it was this uh, notion, it was an article that I read about this notion that one of the most important things that CEOs do is make decisions. To be decisive Mm -hmm. can be one of the signs of someone who really should be a leader. And one CEO in particular, it might've been the head of Merck who said, I only have about 60% certainty most of the time. I don't ever have 100% certainty. (laughs) But once I get to about 60, that's when I make a decision. It's gonna be the wrong decision some of the time but I simply have to keep things moving. And so that actually has been a helpful framework. And I think for your listeners, don't actually expect that you're gonna have a full picture, but get to a place where you feel fairly confident. I think that there's uh, this other notion that I've learned about, people sort of talk about go on your gut. Mm -hmm. At a certain stage of your career, your gut is actually informed. It's not a feeling, it's informed by experiences you've had and things that you've seen. Mm -hmm. I think the real process that I think you're asking me to reflect on though is, at least what I try to do is ask a lot of questions Mm -hmm. (laughs) about what impact am I trying to have? What goals are we driving towards? What really is the outcome we're trying to get to? Because that process of what really are we driving at helps Mm -hmm. cut out noise, bias, assumptions. Mm -hmm. Um, If I don't do that, I can sometimes find myself swayed by, I feel like I should because I think people want me to do that. Well, actually Mm -hmm. they don't, they don't. And so I've asked (laughs) myself a set of questions that get me more clear about, I think this is where we should head. No, I love that because I think you're, you're right that in, in, you know, asking the right questions, but not allowing you're this inner critic or any other critics period sway the way that you're going to go because you want to please somebody or not. And I think that was, you know, really profound in that, what you just said, 60% and I make a decision where women can get caught up in that rumination of like, they want to be absolutely sure. They want that level of certainty that you're never going to get. So at the end of the day, it's, um, I tend to, to give myself a time limit, like, okay, I'm going to give myself, you know, 10 minutes to think about this, gather all the information that I need and make a decision because otherwise I'm not going to make a decision. <laughs> so it's very I interesting. Fantastic. I think the same instinct to want to have perfection, perfect data, perfect mm-hmm. analysis shows up and, you know, this is research-based and this is again, something we all know well, but women want to have a perfect opinion before they speak up in a meeting. Not all women, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's a more female trait than a male trait. And I, my business colleague now, Jonathan McBride, has helped me think differently about, we're just going to riff on this. Mm. And we sort of build creatively. He's very brilliant. He's much more advanced than I am in the diversity and inclusion space, mm-hmm. but we have very different ways of coming at things. And so because we are so different, we build on each other's thinking and and his provocations, good provocations help me sharpen my own Mm. thinking and actually move. We often find ourselves moving in different directions as I've completely changed my mind by the end of a conversation Mm -hmm. because he's been compelling or I've thought about things really differently. And that's, I love what you were saying about that, where sometimes women, and this happens a lot in, you know, the corporate world, in my experience, where they do want to have a very informed opinion before they say something. 
Um, and then they find themselves not saying anything in, in, in meetings and then not being heard, right? Or, or being overlooked because they're not speaking up. So how have you, like you said, now that you are kind of learning this, this practice of riffing and kind of just putting your thoughts and ideas out there, what would be some advice to, to women? Because I know there have been, when I was much younger, I remember thinking, I was thinking something and I wouldn't say it. And then somebody else would say it. And I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I guess I have two ways of answering this one that probably you didn't ask for, but it's really been on my mind. I read something early in COVID about the notion of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm trying to think, I think it was sort of COVID and then BLM. And this writer was saying imposter syndrome is by design. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so don't get it twisted this is intended to make you feel excluded. We have built workplaces by men and for men. And by the way, I don't mean to be depressing. I'm an optimistic mm -hmm. person about pro progress. Right. But I think it's important for women to understand it's not just you. <laughs> there are dynamics, and I'm extremely interested in meeting dynamics because it's mm -hmm. a place where a lot of this stuff shows up. Meeting dynamics are funky. Certain people get called on. Certain people talk all the time. Certain mm -hmm. people appropriate the idea that you just put on the table. You've said it, then someone else says it, perhaps of the you know male side of the house, right. and it suddenly is heard and resonates. That's not that you didn't say it clearly and crisply. That is that there is a dynamic that is making you feel that way. And so I think I want to unpack for women the feeling of it's all your fault, because it isn't. There's also things that are happening by design. Right. So what I learned, I learned this in college. I found college to be terribly intimidating. I thought everyone was massively brilliant. I had no idea what I was doing there. Like, how did I get into this place? But I tried to, in the first few minutes of class, mm -hmm. say something, anything to break. Cause the longer I waited, <laughs> the frankly, the more advanced the thinking got. So I actually could be a little bit more fundamental if I said something early, but I would just get too terrified. So mm -hmm. if I said something initially, I just like, I, it found it, I hearing my voice, literally hearing my voice mm -hmm. allowed me to feel that I belonged in the conversation in a completely different way. So I've, I've taken that into my professional life. I try to say something early mm. um, and that just makes me feel, okay, I'm here. I'm here. My feet are on the, on the floor. I belong at this table. I love that. And I love like hearing yourself out loud, say something like gets you in the conversation. And, and then it kind of like, once you once it comes out and, and once, I, you know, I'm a singer, so I'm always super, super nervous. Then the first note comes out. After the first note comes out, then it's like, okay, I got this. I yeah. feel like it's the same way. As soon as you add, you know, to the conversation, then it's kind of like, okay, I'm part of this chorus now. Like I can just keep, keep, you know, adding. So I love that saying something early so that you feel like immediately you're engaged. Right. Um, that's fantastic. One of the things I've noticed is that you've leveraged your network and your community a lot in terms of the various different roles, but then also, you know, getting um, mentorships from very influential and senior people. Um, one of the things that I realize women struggle a lot with is the concept of one, they, they associate networking to something icky sometimes, um, but even harder is asking for help. Mm. How have you done that throughout your career? I don't do it well. Um, I think it's really hard. And I think women are trained not to do it. We are acculturated to offer help. Right. But one of the things that I've done both at work, but also I've been in my life, parts of sort of groups, cohorts of women, some that I organized, some mm -hmm. that I got invited to join. And one of the things that we did when I ran COP and I brought this into my women's circles is this notion at every single event or mm -hmm. meeting, have a part of the meeting where you do an ask and an offer. Mm. And what I observed is that women had a really easy time offering. Here's something that I can do to help you. They had a really hard time asking, but I would hold up the meeting and say, we didn't hear the thing that you need. So let's just, we'll come back to you, but everybody's going to building that muscle of asking for help help. Mm -hmm. And I, I just did it again where I didn't ask for help on something and it proved to be a disaster. So I, I haven't completely learned this lesson, mm -hmm. um, but it builds closer bonds. I mean, it's really amazing when you've been vulnerable to this. Yes. I don't know how to do this. Right. Um, and I think this notion of networking, it can feel so uh, like a thing to do and I don't know how to do it. And I've often heard women say, I don't have a mentor. She has a mentor. How did she get a mentor? 
one thing that I found unbelievably valuable, particularly as I grow up, mm -hmm. is that my women friends have become my mentors. And the, every passing year, we actually become more and more helpful to each other. We've learned more. And that's not a Pollyanna throwaway comment. I really mean it. My, my best mentors now are friends who I kind of grew up with in New York at 27. They've now become women who really mean business and really know their stuff. And they offer me the best the best feedback and the best help. Mm, I love that. And I think people, um, you know, forget that, that peer mentors are just as important in terms of giving you insight or being supportive or being the ones that can, you know, help you. Um, people usually think of mentors and sponsors of someone, you know, senior to them. And then that's why it seems so like distant. Um, but really look to the side because like you said, there have been peers and colleagues who have kind of traveled the same kind of parallel paths potentially, but have had different experiences and can, and can really, you can learn from them. So I think that's fantastic of looking at the peer mentor as well, because we sometimes overlook that. That's fantastic. So thinking about, you know, this current world and environment and it's always changing and then compounding that with, you know, the digital age and AI and everything changing. How do you stay ahead um, in, you know, thinking about just developing yourself and skills? What are some things that you do to stay ahead that will help our listeners uh, think about being agile? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's funny because this is in a context where, and as I said, I really am optimistic often about mm -hmm. the arc of history bending towards justice. I am feeling discouraged and worried about women as a overall workforce, as I'm sure you are as well, yes. it's concerning mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's multiple things, right? It's the lack of organized childcare. It's a reversal mm. in the home yes. between uh, partners about who's taking on more of the caregiving duties and mm -hmm. home care duties. I've had that in my own life. I mean, it's like stunning. <laughs> How is this happening? Yes. So I find that very, very deeply concerning. About me personally, what I try to do is stay abreast of things that I genuinely find interesting. I think earlier in my career, I would try to read things because I thought it was the right stuff to stay abreast of. And mm -hmm. I found it stressful and mm -hmm. burdensome. Yes. And instead, what I've done is figure out what I really care about is uh people and culture. I care about inclusion. I care about scaling culture within companies and outside. I care about corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. I care about movement building. And that's where I want to spend my life. And that's where I'm going to read voraciously. And everything has a tech foundation to it. And so yeah. I try to stay very current on the technology and AI trends that inform that. Mm -hmm. and people analytics as it relates to human resources. And I've stopped, like there are meaningful trends in national security and in global dynamics. And that is not where I plan to spend my career. And so mm -hmm. I'm not gonna, if I find it interesting, I'm gonna read it, but I'm really comfortable swimming around in the stuff because the field that I'm interested in is massive, as you know. Yes. And so I wanna just swim around in this, mm -hmm. and not worry about what I should be staying abreast of. I, I want to be abreast of the things that I find deeply interesting. I think that's so important in making sure because it aligns with your North Star, right? And so the things that you are staying, um, you know, just uh, on top of are what interests you opposed to chasing something that, you know, at the end of the day may not, you know, it one, it doesn't align and two, there's just this level of you're not going to keep that momentum going if, if it, there's just not the motivation there for it. So I love that of just identifying what is it that you enjoy and staying on top of that. I think that's sound and sage advice. So in closing, um, what is some advice you would like to leave with our listeners in terms of making sure, you know, they are accelerating in their success and continuing to move forward in their career? Yeah, it's a good question. It's funny. I'm I'm uh, behind my laptop. I have a vision board. I don't remember having done a vision board before, <laughs> but I went through the Hudson Institute's Life Forward program recently. One of my favorite chief people officers is my dear friend, Keisha Smith, who runs HR at Tory Burch. And uh -huh. she said it was the game changing experience for her mm -hmm. from a HR leadership perspective. And I took many, many things away from the four days. Mm -hmm. 
But I think the most important thing as reflected on my vision board is the notion that we are not just workers. Mm. We are many, many things. And so this piece of paper that I have here reflects uh, the things that I want for my children, the relationship I want with my husband, how I want my body to feel, the ways that I want to give back to the community, the work that I'm interested in, uh, the beauty that I want in my life. And oddly enough, it sort of feels more European to think that way. I think there's mm-hmm. different cultures that think more comprehensively about life in its totality. Right. And until fairly recently, I thought of myself as, I think probably because of my Irish Catholic worker parents, that work is the thing that you focus on and things get sacrificed. And I just had a job where I sacrificed life, health, husband, and children in a way that was terribly detrimental, terribly. And I, I cannot ever do that again. Mm. And so I really would say to anybody listening, early as you can, love and appreciate and honor all of the different pieces and sides of you, then be intentional about nurturing all those different sides, maybe not equally every single day, but try to uh, have gratitude for what you have. And when you're overcorrecting, it's okay. You're gonna sort of overcorrect, but sort of gently sway yourself back to a place where things are healthy. And I don't like the word balance because who has balance, but healthy and rich and, um, and full and you know, sane. That is beautiful. Bringing your whole self to work and just integrating life into it, right? It can't yes. just be the solo a siloed piece. Um, fantastic. Well, Chloe, this has been a remarkable conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I know that our listeners are probably going to maybe want to connect or hear more from you or of you. So what's the best way for them to be in contact or follow you? Oh, absolutely. So I'm, I'm, gosh, I wish I was better at social media. I'm obviously on LinkedIn. Yes. Um, I have a completely embarrassing Instagram presence, but anyone can email me. It's chloe.drew at Gmail. And I would love to hear from anybody. Fantastic. Well, thanks again. And I appreciate your time. It has been lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much.